On a rocky cliff overlooking the cold yet fertile waters of the North Atlantic, early Neolithic settlers fresh off a short yet treacherous voyage across the choppy waters of the Pentland Firth gazed out over the expanse of icy water before them and decided that they had reached the edge of the world. Although there's no record of this event, it's assumed to have taken place because in 1850 a tempest struck the Orkneys in Scotland and blew away sand dunes and their scant grassy cover, exposing a tiny hamlet that archaeologists named Scara Bray, or Scara Bray with the Scottish brogue. It was a permanent settlement of perhaps 50 to 60 people living in sandstone houses with walls that protected residents' private sleeping and living quarters from neighbors and frequent hostile and deadly elements. Evidence found there reveals that these early Arcadians enjoyed a well-balanced diet of courtfin wrasse, mussels, oysters, and red brim from the shallows. They cultivated wheat and barley and raised cattle for milk and meat. This settlement may be crude by today's standards, but Scada Bray was established in Orkney long before the pyramids were built in Egypt, and even a thousand years before later Neolithic people dragged Welsh rocks onto the Wiltshire Plains of what is today southwestern England to erect Stonehenge. At 5,000 years old, Scara Bray is not, however, the oldest settlement found in Britain and Ireland. But like the oldest settlement, it's located close to the sea. The oldest known settlement in Britain and Ireland is located at Mount Sandal in Northern Ireland near the banks and mouth of the River Ban. It's a Mesolithic settlement that dates to 7,000 BCE, some 4,000 years before Scotter Bray was built. A brief look at the Irish landscape suggests that the founders of Mount Sandal were quite astute. This part of Ireland is in the northeast away from the gales that blow in from the Atlantic. The Irish seaside of the island is, in an Irish sense, a gentler landscape. The ample supply of limestone rock neutralizes soil acidity and contributes to, contributes to the lush green vegetation that gives Ireland its colloquial name, the Emerald Isle. There are other Mesolithic sites in Ireland, including one at Sutton, but none is as old as Mount Sandal. Each of these places show that Mesolithic people built residential structures, but they also illustrate that they had a concern for properly doing away with waste materials in landfills called middens or middens. Archaeologists have found in them bones discarded after hearty feasts on red deer, wild pig, salmon, shells from crustaceans, and at a site in the Dingle Peninsula in Ireland, cattle bones. These waste dumps accumulated into mounds as much as 5 meters in height and 100 meters in diameter. They're undeniably treasure troves for archaeologists. Mesolithic peoples understood that life on or near estuaries provided ample supplies of food. Imagine living in a place where one could regularly dine on fresh venison, pork, oryx, which are ancestors of domesticated cattle, hazelnuts, wild pears, crab apples, a variety of shellfish, and other sea life. Because of decomposition, though, it's difficult to determine what other kinds of plant life supplemented their diets. Nevertheless, humans' preference for living by large water bodies is an ancient and common trait among all of our ancestors, no matter where they ventured or where they lived. This recalls an observation made by the Welsh historical geographer E.G. Bowen, who I mentioned in other videos. Bowen noted that at least since the Mesolithic culture period, coastal settlements functioned both as places of refuge and as stepping stones of cultural diffusion or coastal diffusion. One might add that these locations were the most coveted spaces and may well have served as primitive or permanent living settlements, even before the agricultural revolution introduced permanent settlements in inland locations. This is seen in the type of materials found in middens. As Brian Sykes points out, these sites, especially the one at Mount Sandal, were permanent enough for residents to use logs to construct houses. This is an this is apparent from the location of post holes, which would have served as insertion points for corner posts. 
Among the seeds and bone debris found in the midden or miden, that's Mount Sandal, were animals and plants that suggest seasonal or season specific availability and consumption. There are hundreds of salmon bones which show that the site was occupied in the summer when salmon, fresh from the sea, uh, pushed upstream to their spawning grounds. Huge numbers of hazelnuts and uh, seeds of water lilies, wild pear, and crab apple show that the site was used during autumn harvest of wild forest food. The remains of young pigs which were born in late autumn are the sure sign of winter occupation. It's also known that the residents used ring barking to clear forests, which would allow for certain nut-bearing species like the common hazelnut, which was of course their favorite, uh, apparently one of their favorite things to eat. Although ring barking is an effective way to bring down even a behemoth tree, it's a slow death for the plant. Nevertheless, it shows how Mesolithic people saw how different elements of nature could work together for their benefit. This suggests a people who were not mindlessly following herds of animals for their survival as in typical hunter-gatherer scenarios. Indeed, their use of ring barking tells us that they understood tree physiology, although they would not have used words like phloem, cambium, and zellum cells. By using stone cutting tools, the ancients simply carved a ring around the tree, which effectively cut off the supply of food through the phloem or inner bark and then into the water supply and pipeline formed by zellum cells in the outer wood. Within a year or so, the tree would die, wither, and succumb to the ravages of a gale force wind. The felling of trees allowed sunlight to penetrate newly opened spaces in the forest canopy, providing opportunities for new growth and browsing material for red deer and roe deer, as well as new growth of hazel shrubs, their source of their favorite nuts. Fabricating felled trees into useful timber for building and cutting larger logs into smaller pieces for fuel to eat homes and cooking in large pits required a reliable source of material suitable for cutting woody tissue as well as for butchering flesh and scraping animal hides. Flint and the River Band area also added to the local environment's cornucopia of life-sustaining resources. The river watershed indeed provided local Mesolithic people with ample supplies of flint buried in chalk layers. Archaeologists have found flint from Mount Sandal area in a few other places. Their discoveries certainly suggested that cultural diffusion occurred from Mount Sandal, but it may also show the extent of the hunting grounds of the semi-permanent people who enjoy life centered at Mount Sandal. Flint materials from this part of the island have been discovered down the east coast of Ireland, including in Dublin Bay, and further east, about halfway across the Irish Sea on Ellen Vannon, the Gaelic name for the beautiful little Isle of Man, and one of the sources of the, my surname, Van, of Man, Van. Flint from the River Ban area has also been discovered by archaeologists along rivers and lakes headed southwestward into Canute. The evidence certainly hints that some Mesolithic peoples, at least at the edge of the European world, were living in a virtual Garden of Eden long before Neolithic farmers arrived from the Near East. The settlement at Mount Sandal was 2,000 years old when the agricultural revolution arrived in western France. Ample evidence from coastal areas in, the, in East Asia show that early people made similar uses of such places. When Mount Sandal was flourishing, a similar village named Hamudu was built on an estuary in what is today eastern China. Archaeological evidence found at Hamudu is dated to about 5000 BCE or 7100 years before the present, about 2000 years before Skara Bray was established and just after uh, Mount Sandal was established. Located near the modern village of Hangzhou, the marshy coastland presented the ancient builders with some settlement challenges, um, yet periodic flooding gave the land nutrients that fed native stands of wild rice. Hamudu and Mount Sandal are located at opposite ends of the Earth's largest land mass, Eurasia, but in the larger period of human existence, the similarity in their ages is remarkable. These villages were not products of Neolithic farmers from the Near East, they were built by people who clearly understood a great deal about their environments. 
and chose sites that offered similar resources. Given that genetic research shows that Europeans and Asians share common ancestors who lived in Central Asia about 40,000 years ago, it's almost as if their offspring had raced away from each other in opposite directions. If building a village at the edge of the world was their goal, it would be difficult to declare a winner. Their ages are similar to each other. Thank you for joining me today on The Vantage Point. I look forward to seeing you again. God bless you and yours. Bye-bye.